Well, welcome everybody. Uh, before we do anything else, I'm going to remind you to silence your phones. Especially those of us that are speaking, we have to remember to do that. There's nothing more embarrassing than speaking and your phone's starting to ring in your pocket. But um, I am actually not speaking beyond this point. I am just going to kind of introduce you, welcome you, welcome to Village Bible Church. Uh, this event is actually being sponsored by Pilgrimage Christian Center in Raven and Springs. And just want to just talk real briefly about what that organization is. Um, that was founded in 1979, uh, and it was the first several years it existed, it supported Christian education in homeschools and Christian schools. And so it's really neat to be now, what, 40-some years later, doing the very same thing. And this will be the first event Pilgrimage has had like this, where it's an actual conference, where we've got speakers and a lot of families coming to hear what's going on. Um, so this morning, if you're probably aware of what's going to happen, so this morning uh, we're going to have Dr. McDonald's going to speak first, and he will kind of give us what says on the screen behind me, the nature of child, the critical nature of child education. I think it's going to be very eye-opening uh, to all of us. And then there'll be a short break, so you can go out and get coffee and cookies, and you're free to bring that stuff in here. Uh, just don't spill it. <laughs> um, but no, you're, you're, feel, feel free to bring that stuff in here. And then um, after that, then uh, Jerry Cox will come up here, and he's going he's gonna to share some stuff about the laws, and um, not the scary stuff so much as just some of the opportunities that are afforded in Arkansas to homeschoolers, uh, some of which you may not be aware. And he's just going to kind of touch on some of those, and he has a whole lot more information that he could spend all day talking about, but he's going to try to do it in about 30 or 40 minutes. And then after that, of course, Melissa, my wife, will be sharing just about how to make homeschooling work, kind of in the trenches, tips and tricks, that, that type of thing. So, um, and then there will be time for question and answer at, at the end of each one of these presentations, and also breaks to use the bathroom, get coffee, and those types of things. So, uh, before we go any further, I'm going to pray, and then I'll welcome Dr. McDonald. God, I just, uh, I thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to have this conference, uh, for uh, Dr. McDonald and Jerry Cox and Melissa, and Lord, for the experiences, the knowledge, and the skills that you've given them that they're going to impart here today. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just work through this conference, Lord, for parents who are currently in the trenches of homeschooling, that they would be encouraged. For those who are considering uh, jumping into the trenches, that they would be, see the the value of it for themselves. And for those maybe who are just kind of here to see what's going on in this field, that, that they would be uh, just encouraged by the possibilities and, Lord, that they would be inspired to be champions for child education and, and for the parents who take that seriously. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just bless each one of our speakers as they present, give them confidence and clarity. And do pray, Lord, for those who will be watching online that they will be able to follow along clearly and it would be ministry to them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Dr. McDonald, I first heard him, was it in January or February? I can't remember. Um, at a family council prayer meeting, he spoke, and he presented a lot of the same information you're going to hear this morning. Um, and I was just struck by, in 30 minutes, he presented so much information um, on the nature of child education. And... Um, and so I almost immediately contacted Aaron Hogan at Family Council, who had arranged that meeting, and said, hey, uh, can can we get David up here? And so uh, Dr. McDonald agreed to come. He is a, has a very busy schedule. Um, he teaches biblical worldview literally all over the world. Um, and he also teaches parenting and world religions. He is going to be, he's going to be leaving here this morning after this conference. Um, he's got a another one in Philadelphia um, where he's going to be uh, doing an education summit in Philadelphia on Monday. And then from there he goes to uh, Washington, D.C. for three days presenting education initiatives to leadership. So he has a busy schedule. And so we're very honored that he was able to come here and, and speak to us this morning. And so um, I just, as a, just by way of bio, he has five kids ages 16 to 23, 
and he has three grandkids. So that kind of gives you a little picture of who Dr. McDonald is. And so with that, I'm going to turn over to him and let him uh, speak. I've used up a lot of his time. Of course, we start a little bit late. So those of you that are, are used to being in church with me, I like to start things on time. And we started late this morning, so I apologize for that. No worries. Can everybody hear me okay? It seems like that's a little too close. Is that a little bit better? All right. Perfect. Well, welcome, all of you, even way in the back. So it's good to see so many people here today. It looks like there's a bunch of moms here today, too. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of give a snapshot of where we are. I want to give you kind of an understanding of where I come from. So I come from the Pacific Northwest, Seattle area. And um, a lot of times what happens when I come to areas that haven't percolated as long, I tell them, you know, basically I'm coming from the future. I've lived through and what you think would never happen, right? I was experiencing in the 70s and 80s that this would never happen. And so I just kind of want to give a caveat of that. I'm going to show you where a lot of these things are coming from. The beauty of this is I get to be followed up by Jerry. Jerry's going to tell you some of the freedoms that are afforded here that aren't in Washington State, that aren't in Oregon, and why we need to preserve and protect those. And then you're going to get some real practical points um, from Melissa when she comes up of somebody kind of who's in the trenches. So we're going to be talking a little bit of the philosophy and the importance of what we're doing. And so I'm just going to start out with education is both a goal and a mandate. And so I'm not referring to schooling. Education comes from all different areas. And so understanding what education is, and it's just a transfer of knowledge from one aspect to another. Okay, I'm going to be using the term worldview. I'll be defining that, what it means. But we transfer education by the way we live as parents, grandparents, siblings, brothers and sisters. One of the ways we do that is schooling. I'll be primarily focused on that. What most people don't realize is that education was part of the Great Commission. So we teach them to observe all that I have commanded. Often we boil down the Great Commission only to teaching them about who Jesus Christ was. But it's actually holistic. It goes for everything. So education shapes worldview. Education um, shapes how do we know the truth? Is truth based on feelings? We've abandoned right now empirical education that, you know, biology says this is what a man is, this is what a woman is, and now it's whatever we feel like. And so we call that epistemology. It's how we know who we are. Do we come from goo? Or is there a higher purpose to who we are? Purposelessness is endemic in younger generations. The suicide statistics sadly bear this out. What happened down in Uvalde, Texas, isn't as a result of a gun. A gun was used, but what happened was the worldview of purposelessness, hopelessness, combined with animus. Then the vehicle used was that, but that's not solving, removing this, a gun will not solve. And so what we are seeing is the maturation of a worldview that has been imbibed within culture over and over again. And sadly, we're going to see this more and more. And so what we think about our origin, where did we come from? Are we random chance? Biochemistry? Or did we come here made in God's image? Where are we going? If this is all there is, even Paul says, we may as well eat, drink, and be merry. But if there's something more than that, and so how we think about worldview drives everything. So ideas shape action. Worldview shapes what you do. And what we're seeing now in the church too often 
in education too often and in politics too often is there's a stated worldview but not a lived worldview. And so we're going to be focusing in what is it that, where is it that we're driving? Where is culture driving? Where is education driving? Where is politics driving? So I want to give just an, an understanding of what I mean by this. Ideas have actions. So if we look at the Christian worldview says we're made in the image of God. Materialism, Darwinian materialism says we're made in the image of what? Random chance. So Charles Darwin says this. It is surprising how soon a want of care, care wrongly directed, leads to the degradation of a domestic race. But excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. So we only have to go to his son to figure out what he meant by that. His son was a classic eugenicist. The aim of eugenics should be the production in future ages of the highest type attainable. It must be wrong to attempt to raise the black races by any process which would result in the lowering of the white stock. When was the last time your evolutionary biology professors taught you the worldview behind evolutionary biology? It was eugenics. See, ideas have consequences. Planned Parenthood was started by Margaret Sanger. Here's a copy of a letter she wrote to Dr. Clarence Gamble. This is 1939. We don't want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Yet, is this celebrated? No. So what we have is a stated worldview of compassion. We care about what? My body, my choice. We care about women's rights. But memorialized in writing, we see a far different thing. And so we fast forward. We're almost 80% of all Planned Parenthood today are in minority communities. So ideas, worldview, consequence, right? Not stated worldview. So there's deception and then there's truth. So let's look at another one. Worldview. Brett Kavanaugh, believe all women. Well, some women. And now our latest Supreme Court is what? What is a woman? How do we know truth? She says, I'm not a biologist. If I walk outside today, it's sunny. Do I have to be a weatherman? Right? This is, this is the reality, though. Like, it's funny, but if I go to my alma mater where I, got, where I graduated from at University of Washington, this would not be the pervasive ideas and the pervasive understanding. It's influencing culture. If you look at the biggest bands, BTS, they set a record, 113 million views. Okay, this is Korean. Korea has probably more missionaries per capita. It's the most Christian nation. If you go back 30 years ago, this is what's happened to them. Number one band in the world. Gender fluid. Guarantee you, you walk into the elementary, middle school. They primarily ta target middle school and down. Number one band. They're pushing gender fluidity. Taylor Swift. Does this impact culture? You know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. The mockery, open mockery of Christianity. Yet within the church, this is what is being listened to. And we have this cognitive dissonance between, wow, I'm so shocked X is happening to these kids. And at the same time, we're bringing in these worldviews. I'm not shocked at all. I talk to kids. I talk to teenagers. Number one Spotify streaming song, Harry Styles. It's as it was. Number one. This is, this is not fringe. This is mainline. Harry Styles wearing a tutu. Number one album. I think you have 
to take me. I am who I am. Do you think that was a mistake when he said that? Does that remind you of anything else? Yet I guarantee you this, if I go to any elementary school here and middle school. So what about the church? Similar, twice last year, number one, LGBTQ. Praised by bands like Switchfoot. It's permeating the church. Where do I think this is going to go? It's very easy to see. There is no safe area. The world is aggregating. Ideas are aggregating. People think that, oh, geography is going to save X, Y, and Z. It's not. This is pervasive. Let's look at what's happening in Oregon. K through 12 school, the Minstrel Dignity Act. And so what I did is I actually took this from kind of a leftist newspaper, but it's a mainstream. And the Menstrual Dignity Act requires in men's restroom, starting at kindergarten, in all public education, feminine hygiene products. Why is that? Why would they even start at so low before menses is even an issue? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's to change the way people think? Absolutely it is. Now this is state law in Oregon. What's happening here? There's an amendment that's being passed around to get signed to change Arkansas public education. And essentially, the goal of this amendment is to remove any publicly, affected, uh, publicly elected uh, official to the State Board of Education in Arkansas. They want people who have gone through higher education indoctrination. You will have to have a master's or doctorate to even sit on the Board of Public Education. It's supported by socialists, all sorts of things. Now, this bill is being pushed, this this, actually, it's not a bill. This piece of legislation is being pushed in order to raise teachers' salaries. That will be the guise that it will be under. But if you actually read the bill, it's to change the way people think. No parents, no elected officials. I won't read through it. If you want to know more, you can look at it. What's happening at University of Arkansas? University of Arkansas Law School. This is the interim dean. What's interesting, when you look at what's happening in higher education, thinking what's going to shape the legislative background in this state, you look to the law school. Because how a law school is run is how your future politicians will be impacting it. And so let's look at what the dean of the law school is. She's just been there a few months. Uh, Professor Allen plans to resign. She resigned her position. If black lives matter, then black candidates should matter. If black lives matter, then the feelings of black faculty should matter. At one of the most liberal law schools in the U.S., they weren't liberal enough for her. She got a unanimous board acceptance to become dean of the law school in this state. So Allen's research includes study of health policy and critical feminist theory. If you want to know what's coming down the pipeline, it's really easy to see. This uh, is from the Babylon Bee, which is kind of interesting. And I want to focus now on um, two different worldviews. Teachers who insist they're not teaching your kids about sex also weirdly outraged by ban on teaching your kids about sex in Florida. The so-called <laughs> don't say gay bill. Why are they so bothered if they say they're not caring? And so I want to boil this down into really two worldviews for you. There's the worldview of truth, and there's the worldview of deception. The devil not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. That is really easy. Most things, when I look at news stories, a lot of people are like, oh, how did you find that? And I look at it, and I go, does that sound like a lie? Let's find the lie behind it. And it's really easy. When he speaks, he speaks his native language. He is a liar and the father of lies. Let's contrast to what Jesus said. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, I'm a pretty simple person, really. There's lying, and there's not lying. There's truth, and there's falsehood. So, right now, we're undergoing the biggest faith gap that we've seen uh, since they've been doing history. In 70 years, George Barna um, has said, between parents and children, between two generations now, between grandparents and children, there is no bigger faith gap in recorded history. So what the younger generations to grandparents, we are in for a crisis. We will feel everybody, and, and I'm dreading it, and then this next off-handed election, you're going to see, oh yeah, we're winning, we're doing so great. We're not. Don't believe it for a second. Yeah, we'll probably take the Senate. There's a good chance the House may shift. But what's coming down the pipeline, it's not even close. If you look at uh, kind of what's going through there, 30% of young Christians now identify. That doesn't mean that they support it. They currently identify in our country as LGBTQ. And my goal is to show you where a lot of this is coming from. Where has this happened? So, Barna, also part of this study, if you want to contact me, I can get you a copy of it. It's a, lo a larger study, but the pith of it is no longer do kids trust the church. They don't trust pastors. Um, a lot of times, if you look in the past, the authority that pastors bestowed on the family, God's first government, the most important element in society. You look at Uvalde. Before I even knew anything, I knew there was no father. As I looked, absolutely that was the case. You have a drug-addicted mother who says he's a good boy. An absent mother. How many news stories do you see published about the crisis that's happening in the family? It's direct correlation. There is no other statistic, no other statistic that will show success rate beyond having an intact family. This is where I want to put a plug in for Arkansas Family Foundation. In their name, they fight for the rights of family. If you're not connected with them, get connected with Jerry. Get connected with their organization. Be aware of what's happening. Ignorance is not an excuse anymore for what's coming down the pipeline. The, the, the reality of what we're facing, though, is we were given a model to transform culture. And they've literally just stolen that model from Christianity. So if we open up Timothy and it says, in these things... You, Timothy, have heard me, Paul is the one speaking, say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be then qualified to teach others. So you have four generation model. Paul is teaching who? Timothy. Timothy is teaching things he's heard and re with reliable people to go, those are pastors, to go teach other people. Those are the students. Higher education are your Paul and Timothys right now. Okay. How do you get to be a certified teacher in Arkansas? You go to University of Arkansas and get your teaching certificate. They've been imbibed with the worldview. Then they go and what? Teach others. They teach the students. And then they teach what is through K through 12. What's interesting, I was doing... Um, kind of a large parent conference, and I asked this question. I said, how many of you would send your kid to a Hindu ashram for their education? How many would send to an Islamic madras? Now, how many would send it to a Marxist indoctrination center, the public education system? See, I would send my child far more to an Islamic madras where at least they'll understand some aspect of virtue. The most common saying within an Islamic center is going to be God is greater. They'll at least have an understanding of God. Yet we expect somehow that's going to look different. 
See, Jesus Christ, he had a way of saying things and boiling things down. He said, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he's fully trained will be like his teacher. And this has happened over and over again in history. Dr. Victor Frankl, he's both an MD and PhD, went through Auschwitz. I'm going to let his words just kind of simmer on what he saw as the problem was not the Third Reich. I'm abs- this is what he said. I'm absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz were ultimately not prepared in some ministry other in Berlin, but rather at the desk and lecture hall of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. Hitler admitted, nothing makes me more certain of our victory of ideas than our successes in the university. And Stalin said, education is a weapon. And we have to see education for what it is. Education is a weapon. We have forgotten this idea that children go out as what? Arrows. But that's not what, we do, what, that's not what we're seeing them as. We're not raising our kids to go out as arrows, to change a culture. We don't see them as weapons. Instead, we give them over to be weaponized. Abraham Lincoln, the philosophy of schoolroom in one generation, will be the philosophy of the government in the next. You want to know why we're getting our bills? Go to higher education. Martin Luther gave us a warning. He said, I advise no one to place his child where scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are increasingly occupied, not increasingly occupied with the word of God, must become corrupt. We see these warnings going all the way back to Judges. Another generation rose after them. They followed other gods from among the gods, all who are around them. That's what's happening. Walk into an elementary school, local here, find out who their gods are. It's very obvious who they are. They're the same gods that I see when I speak in California, Philly, D.C., Africa, Nigeria, anywhere. Almost universally, the world has shrunk, and we worship the same gods. Hosea, the warning is so sharp. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This is what's happening to America. We are being destroyed, but our lack of knowledge is an active rejection of knowledge. We can see that so clearly right now. What is a man? What is a woman? His older brother went with a gentleman named Joseph back, back home, I don't know, it's probably three years ago, to the Women's March, it's, it's a very vulgar march, in D.C. It was, and they asked a simple question, what is a woman? They flew back to D.C. the following week, and they asked the pro-life march, what is a woman? From this, that video went viral. Matt Walsh has now made, based on their video, this great thing. And then he goes around and, and asks the same question, what is a woman? See, that's an active rejection of knowledge. And so what happens, I reject you from being a priest. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. There's not a big surprise of what's happening. I look no further than the narcissistic family, the breakdown of marriage, the separation to see the destruction that's happening. Often I'm speaking in churches and we have allowed a narcissist Jesus, a Jesus that is for me personally to give me a better life. And we flip the whole idea upside down. Instead of me serving God, understanding the nature of my sin, dying to myself, I want to raise to myself. I become a God. And then when conviction comes in, the Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin. I don't want to do that. I want a safe space. Don't judge me. Safe space culture developed in the church and then went out. John 16 says, Jesus goes, I must go away. The paraclete, the advocate will come, the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
Without the understanding and knowledge of sin, the cross does not mean what it should mean. When we see the cross for what it is, then we move into thankfulness, compassion, and the fruits of the Spirit. And that's what transforms culture. It's the death of ourself. It's seeing children as what? A blessing, not money. Money is not the blessing, yet we think God wants to give us the thing he warned about most in Scripture. And now, from often from pulpits, kids are a pain. They're mocked. But do you know who values children more than anything? Satan and those who follow Satan. This is from Adolf Hitler. The state must proclaim the truth that the child is the most valuable possession a people can have. In the matter, the state must assert itself as a trustee of a millennial future in the face of which the egotistical desires of the individual count for nothing and will have to give way for the ruling of the state. I wish that was shouted from every church. Mothers, fathers, your desires count for nothing. The most valuable thing you have is your children. There is nothing more important. January 15, this is what the Michigan Democratic Party said. We're not sure where this parent should control what's taught to their children comes from. Where do you think they got that from? Marxist ideology trickled through the Third Reich, implanted into that. Biden, right? April 27th said, they're all our children. What does that sound like? Okay, they're not somebody else's children. They're like yours when they're in the classroom. That's, what, that's from the president about six weeks ago. Let's listen to what Hitler said almost 100 years ago, 90 years ago. Whenever opponent declares, I will not come over to your side, I calmly say, your child belongs to us already. What are you? You will pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand in a new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. See, the education, according to Marx, from the, uh, for all children, from the moment they can get along without a mother's care, shall be in state institution at state expense. Why is that? They want to separate the bond. That's why you, you see all of these programs. Let's get kids in. We have kindergarten, child garden. Then we have pre-kindergarten. Now we have th pre-three pre kindergarten. Maybe we should keep kids till the time they're 10, 11, 12 with a mother who cares about virtue, character, and truth. We need to stand up against this. This is what they said. Now, I want you to listen really carefully to the language that they're using. This is Marxism. We want to sweep every way, everything that claims to be supernatural and superhuman. For that reason, we have once and all declared war on religion and religious ideas, and we care little whether we called atheists or anything else. This is 150 years ago. Do you know how many Christians care if they're called a bigot or intolerant? See, who really believes their worldview? This was really a job-killing sentence in the 1840s. But they believe so strongly in this that they say, I don't care what I'm called. We need that culture that they adapted to lies for those who stand on the truth. For those who want to stand on the truth, we need to stop caring what they call us. You know, Christian, right? Acts, 6, Acts 16 was an insult. But for so long, it's allowed us to do better in business and do, do better in things. God forgive us. In our apathy, are wanting to be liked by those who hate God. Marxism, you take a guy like Alinsky, the end of Marxism is the third stage of a new social order. This is where we're at. 
This is, he wrote in a book, Rules for Radicals. I throw this in there when I'm in Arkansas. A lot of times I don't put it in. But if the ideals of Alinsky espoused were actualized, Alinsky was one of the biggest proponents of Marxism in education, the result would be social revolution. As such, he's been feared. This was the master thesis of a politician that shaped the US. And that politician was Hillary Clinton. And here's the copy of where she said that in her master's thesis. It's uh, from page 74 of her college thesis. These things have been around a long time. We're talking over 40 years ago. This idea of shaping a new world order. If you want to see where they're going to go, Rules for <laughs> Radicals spells out, this is my little Second Amendment plug. And he says, Gandhi, basically, if he could have, would have used guns, but they couldn't, so they didn't. Right? 50 years ago, the most effective means are whatever will achieve the desired result. This isn't conspiracy. This is memorialized in their documents of how you change social order. So when you have the top police officer in the U.S., Merrick Garland, and parents are frustrated and upset what happens when they go to school boards. He said, we're going to have the FBI look into them. Now, I would love for every church to point out the simple hypocrisy. Merrick Garland's daughter and son-in-law run a company that, guess what they sell? Critical race theory to school boards. Make millions. I was thankful that Ted Cruz pointed that out. I actually wrote a paper on that for a family research council that went viral, pointing out this really simple thing. Follow the money, follow the lie. Why in the world, with everything that's happening in the U.S., did Merrick Garland put law enforcement toward parents at school board meetings? I go, this doesn't make sense. And... It takes about 10 minutes on Google and you realize, oh, okay, this does now make sense. This is what they're trying to do. So we name schools after our social reformers. Saul Alinsky School. 60 years ago, let's hear what the activists were saying. The judgment as to whether you can trust the future, the social advancement, depending on people will be judged and where they come out on how they think about the gender issue, homosexuality. This is his schools that we name after him. Let's go back a little further. Let's see how far this goes back. John Dewey, the human manifesto. There is no God, there is no soul. Hence, there are no needs for the props of traditional re religion. With dogma and creed excluded, immutable truth is dead and buries. There's no room for fixed natural laws or moral absolutes. He's the father of modern education. So let's see how many Dewey schools that there are if you don't see where they're planting these things. Horace Mann, 20 years after our country was founded. What the church has been for the medieval man, the public school must become for the democratic and rational man. God would be replaced by the concept of public good. So when did this start? At the beginning of it. Do we have any Horace Mann schools? Let that sink in. John Dunphy, listen to how he's talking about this. I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers that correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith. If you do not believe this, look at all of the young women on TikTok who are kindergarten, first grade, second grade, pushing gender ideology right now to this. They perceive their roles as a missionary why do they see themselves as a missionary from higher education? See, it's a religion of humanity that recognizes the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. How old is this idea? If I go back far enough in the Bible, I remember there was somebody who said, and you will be a God. This divinity in every person. We need to remember who we're fighting. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and new. 
the rotting corpse of Christianity together with all its adjacent evils and misery. That was 50 years ago. They laid out. Paul Hobner, NEA, National Education Association, the schools cannot allow parents to influence the values, education their children receive. Our goals are incompatible with theirs. So why are we afraid to go? Your goals are incompatible with mine. To hell with your ideas. That's where they come from. They're diabolical. We need to call them what they are. How many arguments that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God should we destroy? Every argument that raises itself up. We need to go after that. They're coming for homeschool. Elizabeth Bartolet, this is Harvard Magazine, um, says, the issue is, do we think parents should have 24-7 essentially authoritarian control over their children from 0 to 18? I think that's dangerous. I think it's always dangerous to put powerful people in charge of the powerless and to give the powerful ones total authority. Why do you think Harvard Magazine is pushing this? Because they know the danger that happens with discipleship. Discipleship from a mother and father. We need an education revolution. So basically what I work on is getting higher education down to the masses at a reduced rate. It's a project I've been working on. I'll just touch briefly on it. We're in, in uh, we have four MOUs signed with four Christian universities that have a biblical worldview that can do STEM degrees, science, math, if they want to be a doctor, pre-med, pre-law, all of these things. They have now agreed to match in-state tuition. What's crazy about this is 17, 18-year-olds can start in this program, and by the time they're 20, they can have an undergraduate degree. We have a crisis of marriage-less people in the church. It's, it's a problem. And one of the problems is, is they're taking so much debt on from education. They're delaying starting families. They're delaying buying houses. You want to stop socialism? What you do is you have people have property rights. The moment you own your property and you start to get property taxes, it's amazing when you look at the statistics of how socialism dies. I have a video on here. I don't have time to show it. But it's from the World Economic Forum. And they say, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. That's where they're driving this. It's kind of a viral video. There's a much bigger expanded. I put together a book. Um, it's called The Third Education Revolution. A friend of mine, I had him uh, edit it. But if you want more information, um, you can reach out to me. It's David, my last name's McDonald, mcd116 at gmail. Um, thanks for having me. If there's a few questions, I wanted to keep this little bit shorter today, um, but just to kind of touch on, give you a little snapshot from the future of what's coming and the importance that there's really is nothing more important than discipleship. I'm going to give you one positive caveat to all of this that gets me really excited. The power of discipleship is breathtaking. If you go back to this model, and you look and you say, one person, a Timothy, can make two Timothys. And then those Timothys can go make two Timothys. And so on. Now, the sad part is how bad we're doing. But if we started with a mother in her lifetime made two disciples that could go make two more disciples, and we follow that down, right? So we're each one doubles. In 40 generations, if you were to guess, how many people would that be? Let me tell you, it's over 550 billion. That's more people than have ever walked on the earth. We need to elevate discipleship. We need to not abdicate the spiritual role to someone who gets 40 hours if they're on average and say that's the pastor's job. They only get 40 hours. 1,100 hours are spent in education. I'm not even talking about music. I'm not talking about 
television, internet, TikTok. I'm talking in public instruction. 16,000 hours on average K through 12. So there you go. Any questions? And then we're going to go to break. Well, thank you for your patience. Sure. Yes, yeah, I think it, so I'm going to go back in time. 1970, Washington State, Dixie Ray was governor, Republican. Pro-life. We would go out to areas, little community, Squim, Washington. It's not a problem. Go forward one generation, 80% of the kids no longer walking with Christ. If we go back 10 years, I would love to do a poll right here. I bet you 80% of the kids are no longer walking with Christ. See, what deception, the heart of deception is to go, it's not going to happen to me. It isn't going to happen. Go to a Razorbacks football game. Do you see debauchery from people who come from this area to go visit the Razorbacks? Do you see drunkenness? Or do you see the fruits of the Spirit. See, we've lowered the standard. But what causes the destruction is the abdication of responsibility. So if you walked in, in fact, it was really, I did this in Washington. I might have mentioned this down in Little Rock. And uh, there was a MOPS group. Um, I don't, do you guys have MOPS up in Northwest? It's Mothers of Preschool Children. It's a Christian group that churches do, and they're young moms who come together. And I said, how many of you have been to your local middle school and hung out with your kids for like a day? Okay, so take a 13-year-old kid and now understand that 13 or even go to the high school, that 16-year-old young man, is he more or less spiritually mature than your husband? Now, Imagine you walk into your husband's office and his staff members are all dressed in the same manner that the middle school and high school people are that are around your kids. They're telling the same jokes. They're looking at the same pornography on their phones in high school. Are you going to be comfortable with that Or are you going to go, what are you doing in this office? See, now, who's more spiritually mature? See, it really has to do with an abdication. And once that worldview sets in, this is what's going to happen. And so I basically don't buy it. Bentonville, I just met with two people. They're trying to replace five of the teachers, or five of the school board members. Uh, Chris Couch, and I'm new to the area, and I said, Chris, do you know Chris? Yes, yeah, he's he's, uh, active trying to get it. I absolutely believe we should change public education as well. And I said, how is it up here? Because I noticed the same thing, right? You go to First Baptist Bentonville, and you have admin and a ton of teachers. And he goes, it's disgusting what's in the library. Let me show you, let me tell you. He goes, it's a farce. He goes, we tried to get simple, pornographic things removed, and we're told we're not tolerant by Christian board members. He goes, the average parent doesn't have a clue. He goes, we have some of the highest test scores in the nation. That's all they care about. We have abandoned character. We've abandoned a biblical worldview. So my, my, my short answer is it doesn't exist. So, yeah. 
Any other questions before we get coffee, water? Sorry to be so encouraging. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. I, I think the first thing we need to be positive about is their value, that they're made in the image of God, that there's nothing higher. I picked up this worldview from my mom, and I, I don't even think she understood it, but when I was a kid, she looked at me and like, she really thought, you know, you're a child of God. You can do anything. So I grew up believing I could. But you know what makes me sad? And, and if my wife was here, she would bring this far stronger than me, is how many young mothers criticize their kids and their husbands. And is there any wonder what happens down the line with this critical spirit? But see, being, having a critical spirit is not a fruit of the spirit. It's the fruit of the devil. How many dads, the butt of their joke is their kids. Teenagers are a pain in the butt. No, teenagers are a gift from God. You go back in the Bible, there was no higher gift. And so, all of those things, I'm thankful for my house. I don't want the government to steal, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to take this, unpack the question a tiny bit in two ways. And I'm going to ask a question, and this is my view on education. I'm going to come back to it. It'll seem like I'm not, but I'll, I'll get there. Should I be a good father or should I be a good husband? What's the answer to that? Both, right? Too many... Christians, and you probably deal with this more than anybody, is policy, right? I'm not going to get involved in politics. It's like, well, okay, then don't complain when you get California laws. That's like saying, well, I'm just going to be a good husband. So I believe we should fight every battle. And I, and I say, where does Satan Stop. Is he going to stop attacking the family if he's successful in public school? No. Is he going to stop attacking charter schools and school? No. He's everywhere. Okay, so that's my caveat. But now I'm going to bring it home a little bit harsher. Let's think about what value is. So prior to doing this, I was a dentist and I, I was sat on tumor board. And so I did a lot of dental oncology. Okay? And patients would come in with something on their tongue, and it would look like a tongue bite. In fact, I think I showed this down there, a couple of slides. And if, I, if you came to me, and I look at your tongue, and I see that you've got something called squamous cell carcinoma, if left untreated, 80% of people will be dead in four years, or five years. Okay? But if you came to me and I looked at your tongue and I said, you know what? Here's what I have to do to treat your tongue. We're going to cut out over half your tongue. You'll probably never speak again. Then I'm going to put poison in your body. 
And that poison's probably 18 months. Your hair's all going to fall out. It's even going to change your skin. Your stomach's going to slough. You're going to wish you had IBS. It's, it's horrible. You're going to lose weight. You're going to be totally miserable. After that, if you're lucky, but probably not, because I, I kind of feel like it may be in your lymph nodes, we're going to burn you. We're going to focus radiation on your jaw so your saliva goes away. We're going to have to remove any dangerous tooth so you don't get something called osteoradionecrosis of your jawbone and have to remove your jaw. Are you excited to do that? No, because we've talked about the treatment and you don't understand the disease. But if I go to you and I say, these little cells, a lot of them are going to involve your nerve system. The last three years of your life, you're probably going to want to be on morphine. It's going to impact your bones, everything about it. You're going to probably be on so many drugs that you'll be in a delirium. You're not going to grow up and get to know your children. But I have a treatment for you. Now, here's what I have to do. And you will, statistically, get to see your kids. You will get to do this. See, what we've done is when we look at these worldviews, we don't see them as the cancer they are. 80% of our kids are being destroyed. So it's a really hard thing. Yeah, no kidding. But guess what? Hell is worse than this. So when I go talk to parents, if I say, yeah, it is a hard thing. So what? Hell is worse. Do you know how many grandparents I go to? And they say, I wished X. They would do everything that they could have. In my office, I had an elder of one of the most influential churches came in weeping. He goes, my daughter, this came out to me. Do you think that he wished his wife or he had more income in that moment? No. What we have to do is get back to a biblical worldview. Stumbling blocks will come. But woe to them by who they come. It would have been better. A miller's stone was tied around their neck and they drowned than to cause one of these little ones to suffer. Yet we put them, these stumbling blocks of pornography, lust, all of these things in front of them. We need to have a biblical worldview of what God says we are literally giving them to Moloch, to Baal. And then we're surprised at the result. So, yes, great question. I love going into churches who don't elevate children to the biblical view of children that, that God has. And, and one of the things that I, why do I care about this? Because you know what? I didn't have those, that view of kids. I was confronted there was a, uh, a Korean dentist who came to me, and I did a lot of speaking on dentistry. That was actually was a big part of what I did. And um, he goes, you know, I don't even think you're a Christian. You don't have a biblical worldview. I want you to listen to this. That started my journey. So I want to give that same gift for anyone else who has it. I needed to be shook up and waking up. Thank you so much. I'm over time. Let's wrap up. All right, so uh, thank you, Dr. McDonald. Um, it is now a little bit after 10 o'clock. That's my fault because I didn't start on time. Um, but we'll take about a five-minute break. So I know it's shorter than what we had promised you, but uh, we're going to try to make up some time so we can give Jerry Cox plenty of time and Melissa time because there's lots of information here that you guys are going to want to get, and we I, we want to be respectful of your the rest of your day and we'll try to get you out of here by noon if we can and not make you be here all day. Um, as, as helpful as this information is, I know you guys have other things to do too. So uh, let's take a five-minute break and come back in here. Then at 10, 15, we'll call it 10, 15, we'll start. And yes, the, again, there's refreshments and things out there in the foyer, uh, cookies, drinks, that type of thing. So get up, stretch a little bit so you don't fall asleep later on. But um, so... <laughs>